Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here are the stories we're watching tonight. Video shows kids running out of the woods during the Nashville school shooting. And that is just one of a number of new details emerging from Monday's attack as First Lady Jill Biden makes her way there for a candlelight vigil. An 86-year-old Pope Francis is in the hospital tonight with a respiratory infection after having difficulty breathing. But the Vatican doesn't know how long he'll be there. And Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz faces tough questions about unions during a two-hour grilling on Capitol Hill. Have you ever threatened, coerced, or intimidated a worker for supporting a union? I've had conversations that could have been interpreted in a different way than I intended. And we're going to look at why thousands of Chinese migrants have been showing up at the southern border in recent months. And I'll sit down with Microsoft's corporate vice president to talk about the company's AI-powered chatbot and the AI arms race that comes with it. And tonight, the city of Nashville, Tennessee, is honoring the six lives lost in that horrific school shooting on Monday. And not too long ago, First Lady Joe Biden attended a candlelight vigil there. Nashville is still reeling from that horrific loss of such bright lives taken by another school shooter. And meanwhile, more video is being posted of what happened in the aftermath. These kids right there, uh, these are students of Covenant School, and their teacher was helping them escape through the woods by the school when this driver pulled up. We talked to the driver, and we're going to have more on that in just a moment. Meanwhile, investigators are still unraveling the motive for the shooting. There appears to be some sort of manifesto, and police say the 28-year-old shooter, Audrey Hale, targeted her former school. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins me now. Kathy, you talked to the man who helped those kids cross the street. What did he tell you about the day? Yeah, Gotti. His name is Jason Hoffman, and he lives here in Nashville. He's lived here practically his entire life, and he happened to be right by the Covenant School on Monday morning, um, just driving by for work, and that's when he heard gunshots ringing out, and, and then shortly after that, noticed a teacher, a group of students coming out from the woods and trying to cross a very busy intersection, and that's when he knew he had to take action, and no hesitation, he stopped his vehicle, got out of the car and then began directing traffic and tried to usher the kids, the teacher to safety. Here's a little bit more from my conversation. You're a father. Yeah. How does this affect you now? It's terrifying to me. Um, Sam, bye to him this morning at school. You know, it makes you think, is this the last time I'm gonna see my kid? You know, and. I just don't feel like this is a world we should live in uh, like this. And Gotti, you heard there, you saw the emotion um, coming from, from Jason. Um, he has a nine-year-old son also in the third grade. So this hits very close to home. And he said he's actually questioning his school about the security uh, surrounding the school in the wake of this shooting. He says it, it, he can't believe that it's happened in his hometown. I totally understandable. Kathy, I understand that you're, you're at a candlelight vigil. What, what's the mood like there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Gotti, this vigil um, actually just wrapped up a, a few moments ago, but earlier this evening, you saw hundreds of people here in the public square area. We're in the downtown Nashville area. And obviously, folks here, they are grieving, they're mourning, they're united in grief. This is also Music City, and they are trying um, to lift the spirits here because obviously it's been a very heavy couple of days. You've had some musicians also performing, um, trying to lift the spirits here. They, they call Nashville home. We saw Dr. Biden, the first lady, make an appearance. But before she came here, we, we saw her at the Covenant School dropping off flowers at the growing memorial in front of the school entrance. Uh, but we also heard from the police chief as well. The police department, they've been very forthcoming with information about the investigation, uh, but you can clearly hear and, and see the emotion from the police chief as well. He has been struck by this violence. He, he talked about how quickly the officers mobilized to, to save lives and stop the bloodshed on Monday. Another difficult day in Nashville. Kathy Park, thanks so much.
And let's take a look now at the weather that has so many of us here in L.A. questioning how much more our roofs can take. Rain is coming down in parts of California. This morning's commute here was hellish, and now a lot of snow is coming down in the north, which makes driving even worse. Parts of I-80 I were forced to shut down. Some people said they waited about two and a half hours in traffic. And guys, this has been the snowiest of seasons up in the mountains. UC Berkeley's Sierra Snow Lab says they've gotten over 713 inches since October 1st, which is almost 60 feet. But to put that into context, that is taller than a Brachiosaurus uh, or... I don't know, 10 refrigerators deep. And out here in California, something a lot of people are talking about is a Tulare Lake bed. If you don't know what that is, a Tulare Lake was once the largest freshwater body west of the Mississippi. But over decades, it became this massive dry lake bed uh, that's been used for farming. Towns have been built there. And this is Tulare Lake bed today. It is flooding fields and spilling into the local communities, which has a lot of people worried. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now. Bill, I have been dying to talk to you about the Tulare Lake Bed. That It's a massive lake bed, right, with all this rain and snow. Are, are we going to see that lake bed come back from the dead and become a standing lake again? Yeah, some people call it the ghost lake, right, that you can't kill a ghost. It keeps coming back. You know, in the last couple of big El Ninos, 82, 83, uh, where they had a ton of water, it came back, and then a little bit in 97, and now it's coming back to it. So let me just try to explain to people a little bit what we're even talking about, because they're probably looking at us like, what? All right, so at one point, about 200 years ago, the Tulare Lake Bed was the biggest lake west of the Mississippi River. But then when they started farming in the southern portions of the Central Valley of California, they actually drained it. They actually took the rivers and they dammed them up so the water wasn't going into it anymore. But we've had a levee break in the middle of March. And of course, with all the rainfall we've had, there's actually a little bit of a lake forming where it was dry farmland. And so the water now is not draining. And also we've been doing some research. It's very, the soil is very clay-like. So it doesn't just soak down. It kind of just sits there, and it more evaporates than anything else. So it could take a long time for that to happen. And they're afraid of the King River. That's the river to watch as we go throughout the spring season, Gotti, because they they just they don't, the dams, the reservoirs are full. They're releasing the water. Plus, we're going to get the snow melt. And if we get more levee breaks, yeah, Tulare Lake uh, could actually be with us for a while. And, Bill, how are things looking for the next few days? I know that you said things were going to be bad yesterday. I got stuck in, like, two hours of traffic during the morning commute. I was trying not to curse your name. My dad was a weatherman, so I was like, it's not Bill's fault. It's not Bill's fault. And yet I heard you in the back of my mind uh, saying what you said yesterday. Uh, what's it looking like uh, tomorrow in the next few days? Uh, California has about maybe 12 more hours of, you know, showers and thunders. I've seen pictures of hail. Uh, Berkeley had hail earlier today, and there's even been some lightning strikes. If you look here in between San Francisco towards Sacramento in the northern portions of the valley. So the storm is still moving through. It's not as intense as it was. And Los Angeles has been dry for a while. That was the rain you got caught in, by the way. And that's now even cleared out of San Diego. So hit and miss showers as we go throughout the you know, the rest of today and throughout the overnight. And then as we go through tomorrow, this storm kind of dissipates and it regenerates in the middle of the country. Country. In California, you had it kind of easy compared to what they're going to deal with in the nation's heartland. Because we have to worry about two things. We have to worry about chance of severe weather again, tornadoes, and we may even have a blizzard on our hands in northern portions of like Wisconsin and Minnesota. How's that rude for the end of uh, April into the beginning <laughs> of uh, the end of March, beginning to April and April Fool's Day, too. So here I pause this, Gotti. This is as we are looking at Friday evening. All the bright reds in here are strong thunderstorms. Little Rock, Memphis, St. Louis, this entire region from about about Chicago all the way to Louisiana, including Mississippi and including those areas that were just hit by those tornadoes are all in the risk area. Let me clean this map up a little bit. We'll send the storm system on Saturday to the east coast, isolated severe weather in the southeast. So the severe weather threat Thursday, isolated Topeka to areas of Oklahoma City, maybe even Dallas. But Friday is the day to watch. I'm sure I'll be with you here Friday evening and we'll probably be talking about numerous areas under the threat of severe weather. A public service announcement. It's not Bill's fault. He's just the messenger. Bill, thanks so much. <laughs> From white chocolate mochas to caramel macchiatos, so many of us have our go-to Starbucks drinks. But after a Senate hearing today with Starbucks former CEO Howard Schultz, it's probably safe to say Senator Bernie Sanders is not impressed by all those coffee choices. Starbucks has waged the most aggressive and illegal union-busting campaign in the modern history of our country. That union-busting campaign has been led by Howard Schultz, 
the multi-billionaire founder and director of Starbucks, who is with us this morning only under the threat of subpoena. Since 2021, more than 260 Starbucks stores have voted to unionize, but not a single store has a contract. And according to Senator Sanders, the National Labor Relations Board has found Starbucks broke federal labor laws 130 times across six states. Still, Schultz swears the world's largest coffee chain has done nothing wrong. Sir, Starbucks Coffee Company unequivocally, and let me set the tone for this very early on, has not broken the law. Joining us now is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. So, Ryan, uh, we also heard from some other witnesses, right? Who else testified? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we heard from a number of baristas uh, who work uh, at Starbucks across the country, and including uh, ones that have attempted to form unions and have described what would be an effort by the company to try and suppress their union organizing efforts. I think we have sound from uh, one of them as an example. Starbucks and big corporations have a lot of power and money, and they are willing to pull out all the stops to deny, to deny workers a voice and a seat at the table in a union. And that was just one example of some of the various ways that these baristas, these union organizers talked uh, about the efforts that Starbucks has gone to try and prevent them uh, from at least coming to the table and collectively bargaining in some of these uh, stores across the country. But Gotti, it's not preventing that momentum uh, for, from being behind these union organizers. Uh, there are now close to 350 stores across the country who have attempted to unionize, uh, and that number is growing. It's still a small fraction of the number of Starbucks overall, uh, but it's clear that even though the fact the company seems unwilling to cooperate with them, that this union effort is still growing. So we saw Schultz say there that they haven't broken any laws, but here's what I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding. The, the NLRB has found otherwise, right? Aren't, aren't they a federal agency? Yeah, they are, but labor law is very complex, and uh, the, Na the National Labor Relations Board uh, does, to a certain extent, adjudicate some of these cases, but they're not necessarily the final end-all, be-all, and they're not necessarily the ones that decide how to enforce these laws. But to your point, there have been many, many worker claims against Starbucks. There have been 81 complaints for violating federal law, 504 complaints for unfair labor practices and charges. And what was interesting about Schultz's testimony today is that he didn't outright deny some of these charges. He said that they were interpreted in, uh, correctly sometimes. In, in particular, uh, you know, he was accused of, of bullying some of uh, these union organizers, and he said that, you know, the way that they interpreted that was just incorrect. So uh, he definitely found a way to dance around some of these topics. Now, it's important to also point out from Starbucks's perspective, they do believe that they're one of the best employers in the country, that their wages are, are more competitive uh, than those in other parts of the service industry, and that they were offering health care benefits long before many of these other companies were. So there is two sides to this, but to your point about the specific letter of the law, I think there is a lot of evidence that Starbucks is at least dancing right on the edge of it. And, and taking a, a big look at the wide picture here, according to one study, about 10 percent of Americans were in a union. Seventy one percent, though, said uh, that they approve of unions. There is a pretty big gap between those two numbers. Uh, how does that fit into this whole conversation? You know, Gotti, I think that's the big story here, right? It's not necessarily how this is going to impact your caramel macchiato, uh, even though there you know, is that growing sense uh, about the effort to unionize within Starbucks. This is really about a, a more labor rights movement that goes beyond Starbucks. And particularly, it comes with these younger progressive uh, activists who are just now starting to learn about the labor movement. You know, there's basically been a whole generation of Americans where labor unions have dropped precipitously. And part of it's having to do with the lax uh, labor laws and the ability to enforce them like we were talking about before. Uh, but it's also because companies have done a better job uh, of, of taking care of their employees. That is now starting to shift, and you're now starting to see these younger workers start to assert themselves. And yes, the public opinion is on their side. Most Americans believe that you should have the right to unionize. The problem right now is what these Starbucks workers are dealing with is that it is so difficult to do it in a way that is effective because of the laws and because these corporations are so strong that you're just not seeing it as pervasive as one might think. But it's, this could just be the beginning of a second labor revolution. Such a complex issue. NBC's Ryan Nobles, thanks so much. 
And still to come, AI seems ready to revolutionize nearly every industry, but should we all be a little freaked out by that? Later in this hour, we're going to hear from Microsoft's corporate vice president on the future of, well, everything. Plus, we talk a lot about people crossing the southern border looking for asylum, many of them coming from Central or South America. But lately, there's a growing number coming from much further away, China. What was the biggest risk to staying? I'll be going to jail. I'll you would going. go to jail? Yeah. Tonight, Pope Francis is in the hospital with some sort of lung infection. The Vatican said he was complaining about having trouble breathing and expect that he will stay in the hospital for at least a few days. Now, just two weeks ago, 86-year-old Pope Francis commemorated 10 years since he was named head of the Catholic Church. And while he was well enough to oversee that commemoration, there are some questions over what will happen this weekend. It is Palm Sunday, the start of Holy Week, the most important week for Catholics, NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavagna is in Rome following all of it. Hey, Gadi. Well, the uh, day started at the Vatican as every other Wednesday with the uh, Pope presiding over the general audience in St. Peter's Square and looking perfectly uh, fine, apart perhaps a little difficulty uh, in getting on top of that uh, Pope mobile at the end. So it came to everybody's surprise when the Vatican, only a few hours later, uh, early in the afternoon, came up with a statement uh, saying that he was taken to the hospital for some pre-scheduled medical checks. Now, that that version of events was immediately questioned by Italian media, mainly because there was another uh, scheduled event that was um, expected to attend, which was an interview with Italian television uh, at the Vatican. So later, a few hours later, the Vatican came up, uh, came out with another statement uh, specifying that, uh, as a matter of fact, the Pope in the past few days had um, some uh, difficulties in breathing, and so today uh, the decision was made to take him to the hospital for some checks and from those checks it came out that he has a respiratory problem uh, unrelated to COVID-19 but still uh, it requires him uh, to stay in the hospital for uh, an unspecified number of days for more uh, medical uh, checks. Well now he is of course an 86 year old uh, man um, who has also a part of one of the his lungs missing because of an infection that he contracted as a kid so of course uh, there is reason uh, to concern but perhaps uh, not to the point that he's uh, incapacitated to the point that other people at the Vatican uh, should take over his business now uh, the uh, according to the law in the Vatican uh, and tradition uh, when a Pope is gravely ill when he's incapacitated then other people like the Secretary of State and the so-called Camerlengo who right now is an American Cardinal Kevin Farrell they take over the day-to-day -day administration of the Vatican. But if it's just a respiratory infection, as we are being told, the Pope is perfectly uh, capable to continue uh, the, those day-to-day -day, um, uh, commitments uh, that uh, he can carry out uh, from his hospital bed or from the hospital in general. How are people reacting around here? But well, probably they're a little confused because of those uh, not conflicting but even contradicting uh, reports that came out uh, today. And uh, also the latest statement came out later uh, in the evening So and after the evening news. So I'm not sure whether everybody is aware um, that uh, he has respiratory con uh, problems that will force him in the hospital for a few days, but certainly uh, tomorrow we hope that the Vatican will come out with an update on his condition. Gadi? NBC's Claudio Lavagna, thanks so much. We've been covering the crisis on the border for years, and I remember four years ago I was in Texas on the Rio Grande on assignment when a, a group of 40 migrants crossed over, and there was one man who stood apart from the rest. We, we tried talking to him. We quickly realized he wasn't from Central America. He was from Asia. And through Google Translate on our phones, he told us that he had made the trip from China. And I remember Border Patrol officers at the time saying uh, that was rare, but it was something that they were starting to see happen more and more. Well, fast forward to today, and the number of asylum seekers from Asia is skyrocketing. They are trekking through nearly a dozen countries to their final destination, a U.S. border checkpoint, and they are pulling it off with information they get from Chinese social media. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer and producer Arnie Heikala have an in-depth look at what's happening all along the southern border. 
In the surge of migrants illegally crossing the Mexico-U.S. border, there's now a growing number of Chinese nationals who are traveling halfway across the world, transiting through a dozen countries to make it to the border and into America. Uh, Leaving China was a decision Kevin felt he had to make to avoid what he called punishment for speaking out against corruption. He says he was jailed twice and allegedly mistreated by authorities. His family is still in China. That's why we're hiding his identity. What was the biggest risk to staying? I'll be going to jail. I'll you would going, go to jail? I would be going to jail, yeah, of course. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, at least 4,300 Chinese migrants have been caught crossing the southern border illegally in the past five months alone, more than double the total for all of last year. Kevin told us about his journey that took several weeks by plane, bus, boat, and motorcycle through treacherous jungles in the Darien Gap before ending on foot at this barren section of the border where he finally got through. And the migrants we've met, including Kevin, say they aren't paying smugglers. They're able to do it all with information, maps and advice readily available on Chinese social media. How much information is out there helping people make the same journey that you made? Oh, they have a lot of information, trust me. Step by step, it's all there. This is how you get to America. Yes, of course, step by step. Chinese social media sites are even giving tips on where to cross. Here in California, it's considered a better bet over Arizona or Texas because of its immigration policies. So just how much is there at the fingertips of people wanting to leave China for the U.S.? Can you show me the sort of information that's out there online? Oh, no problem. Producer Arnie Hekala and I met with Zhang, who left his family behind in China. Okay, this is detailing out the Mexico portion. You can see the cities are listed mm -hmm. here. It even tells you, like, which buses to take and from where to where. Zhang took us into chat groups on the Telegram app that offer information on everything, where to stay, how to get there, even how much cash they'll need to bring. The new phenomenon is... People are trying to make money from this information. So they're giving a little bits of information out at a time. And if you want more information about particular routes, or if you get further along in your journey, they're going to demand more and more money. What kind of money are we talking about? What is this information worth? At the U.S.-Mexico border, if you want information on where exactly is best to cross, that's going to run between 1300 and 2000 U.S. dollars. If you want a guarantee that you won't be apprehended by CBP, that's going to run you about 10000 to 20000 dollars. That more Chinese are undertaking such a radical journey with no guarantees in the U.S., comes as the country is emerging from years of harsh zero COVID rules and facing a wilting economy. I think what we're seeing now are people who are more middle class who just feel that the opportunities are diminishing and that the political situation has just become a lot riskier. And so they are finding any method by hook or by crook to get out of China. An exodus driven by the power of social media. And NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer joins us now from Beijing live. Uh, Janice, what's happening to these asylum seekers once they get to the United States? Gotti, the people selling the information on social media will guarantee for a price uh, to have someone meet these Chinese migrants at the border. Though in a lot of cases, we were told they actually want to be picked up by CBP because that then allows them to begin their asylum process in the U.S. Uh, from there, every situation is different. Some people will start to work to pay off the debts that they have to family and friends, the, the money that helped get them there, while others, like Kevin, who you saw in the story, uh, are okay for cash, and that allows time to study English and settle in a bit better. What isn't clear right now is whether this spike in the number of Chinese nationals is actually going to trend higher. China has only just reopened its borders after 
Harsh zero COVID rules kept the country effectively shut. And that was also a time when most Chinese passports were not being renewed. So with more Chinese nationals now able to travel and with Title 42 expiring in May, there could be more people undertaking this journey. It's something that both Kevin and Jung told us when we were doing this story, that most Chinese are well aware of Title 42 expiring and they predict a rush at the border. Scotty. NBC's Janice Mackey-Freyer with some incredible reporting. Janice, thank you so much. And coming up, a story that is all about being in the right place at the right time. A good Samaritan looks up to see a pilot lose their landing gear right after takeoff and wait till you hear their incredible story. But first, you got to see this. Not exactly your average shift for Tampa PD, as officers were called about a nine foot gator that made its way into a neighborhood. That big old fella did not go easy, even snapping at the cops a few times during that capture. But the investigators, they didn't give up. They channeled their inner crocodile hunter, they caught it, they read it, it's Miranda rights, and they safely released it back into the wild. We'll be right back. Then it's time now for some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. In Kentucky, lawmakers voted to override their governor's veto of an anti-trans bill. A measure would ban gender-affirming care for trans youth and prohibit conversations about sexual orientation in schools. A bill is set to take effect in June, but court challenges are expected. The FDA has officially approved Narcan to be sold without a prescription. Narcan is that nasal spray used to reverse opioid overdoses. The life-saving medication is expected to be on shelves by late summer. And could a natural gas leak be the reason a Pennsylvania chocolate factory went up in flames? That's what federal safety investigators are now trying to figure out. The factory exploded Friday, killing seven people and hurting 10 others. The crews in Kentucky are trying to remove three loose barges from the Ohio River after 10 of them broke free from a tugboat. One of the barges is still in the water, and it was carrying about 1,400 tons of methanol, which is highly toxic. But officials say there is zero evidence evidence of a tank breach or any leaks. And China is threatening retaliation if House Speaker Kevin McCarthy meets with Taiwan's president next week. She has plans to stop in L.A., where a meeting with McCarthy is tentatively scheduled. But China says that would be viewed as, quote, a provocation. And those seven tornadoes that tore through Mississippi took 22 lives and left dozens more hurt. And this is Aubrey Green and Caleb Drain. They were first cousins sheltering with family in Silver City, Mississippi, when their home was destroyed. Two-year-old Aubrey did not survive. Eight-year-old Caleb is still in the ICU, and their families are not alone. NBC's Maggie Vespa has more. The priority here in Rolling Fork, Mississippi, continues to be getting roofs over survivors' heads because obviously you can't stay in a place that looks like this. This was a chiropractor's office and we're told a juice bar and now basically it is just wreckage, as you can see. Also on the ground, utility companies working to restore power, water, natural gas. We're told electricity is being restored to kind of outlying unaffected parts of the area, which is some progress. I also want to show you this stunning piece of wreckage over here that we just found today. The water tower, or what's left of it, here in Rolling Fork. This mangled, crumpled, downturn mess. The stories coming out of Friday's deadly tornado continue to be horrifying, including that of Alton Lee, a man who says the tornado picked him up out of his house, threw him 30 feet into the air and dropped him in a field. Here's part of what he had to tell us. Take a listen. I went up in the air with the house and it just disintegrated in the air. And they dropped me back down to the ground. They found me 3 o'clock Saturday morning in a, in, a, in, a, in a field covered with debris. The first responders found me. Well, for them, I wouldn't be here today. Just an incredible story. And again, Lee was found, he says, hours later by first responders unconscious in a field. And he says, miraculously, he is going to be OK. A lot of survivors whose homes were destroyed, which includes Lee, are now staying at hotels, shelters, staying with family and friends, knowing those things are temporary. They hope that President Biden's visit is a sign that the federal disaster relief the president promised will soon come to fruition. Back to you. Maggie, thank you. Take a look at this video. This video kind of looks like a video game, right? Well, 
It's not. It's actually an exhibit from Gwyneth Paltrow's ski crash trial, which entered its seventh day today. Both sides have been grilling experts and witnesses and using interesting techniques like that animation or, or stick drawings on a whiteboard to essentially prove the other side is wrong. And at stake here is $300,000 and $1 plus attorney's fees. Terry Sanderson, the guy suing Paltrow, is requesting the $300,000. Paltrow is countersuing for that $1 and attorney's fees. Now, Paltrow's team has been bringing in expert witnesses to the stand over the last two days, reiterating that Sanderson had health issues long before the ski collision. Plus, they've also brought Terry Sanderson back to the stand today, showing him all these Facebook pictures of his travels to Morocco, Thailand, Europe, all after the ski crash. NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett joins me now. So, Mara, uh, back to that. That video game looking animation, it looks like a lot of time went into making that. Uh, that was Paltrow's team introducing that, right? And then it gets tossed out, is that right? Right, and you have to remember, Gotti, there's no video that we know of that exists of this incident. And so the uh, Paltrow's team is basically trying to recreate what Paltrow said to show how it all went down. The judge told the jury, hey, you can't consider this as evidence. But when you look at how realistic this looks like, it also doesn't account for all the other skiers that might have been on the trail or other factors. Like, this is exactly how Paltrow described it. That's what the animation recreated. And so whether juries are told to consider it evidence or not, I mean, it looks very realistic, and that might be something for them to not wrap their head around. I, I gotta say, it also looks kind of expensive. I mean, that's graphic artists making what looks like a video game. Um, I know that Paltrow is asking for that $1 plus legal fees. Would that count as legal fees or could it? If that's what the, if the if her legal team brought it forward and they pay for the, the graphic design team to put it together, one can assume that's going to be on their bill if it ultimately is decided that Paltrow is innocent and Sanderson has to pay those fees, Gotti. What comes next? We're now in six days, seven days of this trial. Uh, what are we looking forward to down the road here? So the, def the defense rested their case today. Sanderson was brought back on to the stand, and you saw all those photos brought up uh, where the defense is basically trying to show he was very active in the time after uh, the accident. He was riding camels. He was scuba diving. He was hiking. He seemed to be in good health, even though he was talking about all these injuries he sustained. And so the defense rested their case. We expect to see a few more witnesses uh, that were on the ski slope brought by the prosecution back on the stand tomorrow in the morning before closing arguments, and then the case will be handed over to the jury for deliberation. We'll be looking forward to your next report. Mara, thanks so much. And this next story, I mean, the only way to describe it is, you know how sometimes the universe acts in such a mysterious, such a, a miraculous way, you think there is no way that this was a coincidence. There has to be something bigger going on. This is one of those stories, but instead of, of someone up there watching down on a person in trouble, it was the other way around. It was someone looking up when they saw a young pilot lose the front landing gear right after takeoff, they got on the radio, they knew exactly what to say, and they totally saved the day. Take a look. Beautiful. A dramatic landing thanks to the skill and nerve of a rookie pilot helped through a harrowing experience by a total stranger. This is the first time we've seen each other. I know, it's pretty crazy. Feels like I've known you forever. And <laughs> this, this, is, this is the first time you guys have seen each other ever? Yes. Yes. 21-year-old pilot Taylor Hash says everything felt fine when she took off last Friday from Pontiac, Michigan in her single-engine plane. But in a nearby aircraft, veteran pilot Chris Yates realized something was off, literally. Just noticed the, the nose wheel, the nose tire, everything fall to the ground and just bounce down the runway. The control tower explaining the situation to Taylor, telling her she was going to have to land her plane without a front tire. Diamond 8 Delta Charlie, you lost your front nose gear tire. Copy, 8 Delta Charlie. Your entire front wheel assembly is on the runway. Roger that. Um, should I remain in the pattern? It was definitely the, the scariest moment I've had um, probably in my life. But Yates happens to be the former director of aviation at SpaceX. He's also a father and says he heard anxiety in Taylor's voice. I was thinking of my daughter and just how um, afraid and alone she probably felt. Yates and the flight controller told Taylor to circle the field until she was ready to land, giving the two of them time to talk. Delta Charlie pilot, what's your name, General? My name's Taylor. And I didn't respond on the radio because I, I just, I couldn't even talk. You know, I was welled up and... Taylor, this is Chris. Um, my daughter's name is Taylor. And I taught her to fly. We're going to be just fine, you know. Thank you very much.
And you can really tell how my voice went from frantic, what am I going to do to, okay, I, you know, I can do this, you know, and that was 100% all thanks to him. With Chris's encouragement, Taylor's confidence grew. You going to be a career pilot? I was planning on it. <laughs> it's a good start. This is a good story to your legacy, kid. Then came the critical moment. Got a kid. Nice job. Here she comes. The nose is going to come down. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. Talk to me, kid. Good. I'm all good. That a girl. I'm proud of you. But as soon as he said that, I just, you know, the waterworks came. And you could hear my voice change at the end. I was, I was crying too. An emotional ending for both pilots who formed a lasting bond in the air. <laughs> You're going to be just fine, kiddo. I'm proud of you. I mean, goosebumps. Best part about it, Taylor says she is committed to flying more than ever now. The two of them are already planning on flying together soon. But this time... Taylor sitting right next to her guardian angel right behind those controls. And up next, the future of everything. When it comes to AI, we've talked about the good, the bad, the overwhelming. Well, today we have one of Microsoft's corporate vice presidents joining us to dive right into all of our questions, so stay tuned. Plus, we're talking TikTok. By now, all government agencies should have wiped the app from their phones, but did they? And are there loopholes in the plan? People, the future of AI is either really exciting or really scary or both. But the bottom line is this. The age of artificial intelligence is here, whether you like it or not, and it is happening fast. We are building in public and we are putting out technology because we think it is important for the world to get access to this early, to shape the way it's going to be developed, to help us find the good things and the bad things. That was the CEO of OpenAI, the company behind Chatbot GPT-4. Right now, that's a software that's being tested by companies all over the world. It's also accessible to everyone at home. And last month, Microsoft introduced a new version of its Bing search engine that includes its own AI chatbot. And since then, the company has already released several new updates highlighting the lightning speed. It's being plugged into a whole lot of products. And it's now available for things like email, calendars, and web browsing. Uh, you can even ask Microsoft Bing to make images from words. We, we gave it a prompt just to check it out. And we asked it to show an image of the Los Angeles skyline in the style of Van Gogh. It spit this image out in about 30 seconds or so. Uh, so joining me now is Yusuf Mehdi. He is Microsoft's corporate vice president. Uh, Yusuf, thanks so much for being here. Let, let's start real fast with a good. Tell me, what are people loving about the new and improved and supercharged Bing? Well, what's uh, a couple of things that they're really loving is it's a better way to search the internet. Uh, today, roughly half of searches don't answer people's questions because you know you you want more than just a web link. Sometimes you want an answer to a question, like can the love seat I'm going to pick up at the store fit in the back of my car? With the new Bing and with AI, you can now answer that question. You can chat with it, and as you were mentioning, you can actually create things like images with your words. That's unlocking a whole bunch of great new ways for people to improve their daily life. And Yusuf, we, uh, I mean, this thing's pretty addicting once you start asking it questions. We actually asked Bing's chatbot how it would regulate itself. I, I want to read the response. It says, quote, there are at least four areas that need regulation, safety, privacy, competition, and honesty. Only by coordinating action across all four will policymakers have any hope of reducing the harm from big tech companies. Now, to be clear, that, that answer, it's, it's actually a little... It's kind of clunky. It's generated by artificial intelligence. It's not fact. Uh, but what do you think comes next in terms of, of regulation? Well, I think there's a, it's, it's a, it depends what part you're, you're talking about. But I think the big thing that's important is first it starts with companies like Microsoft and OpenAI doing a great job to make this technology you know, universally accessible, responsible, and safe for people. Then I think there is a role for governments to play to make sure that there's you know, proper competition, that people's privacy is protected, that there's safety and security with how kids, for example, access to technology. So I think it's a multi-party you know, multi effort to really deliver a great offering for people. There's this letter circulating online. It just came out in the last day or so, signed by Elon Musk, a whole bunch of others calling for a pause on training of AI systems. A lot of it has to do with the fear of artificial general intelligence. What's your response to that? 
Well, a couple of things. First, I think we're a long ways off from artificial general intelligence, which is essentially, you know, a term for a much more powerful AI that I think is still probably many years in the making. But, you know, what I would say is, look, I salute the general notion, which is we want to have safety and responsibility with the AI we've got. But I disagree with the recommendation that says, hey, we should just stop working on it. In fact, the approach we're taking with OpenAI, which is to bring it out carefully in the public, to test it so that you can learn and see how it's working so that we're transparent, so that everybody who's got an opinion and sees the technology and development can, you know, can speak about it. I think that's a better way to bring the tech, this great technology to the world. Uh, we've heard uh, Sam Altman, we've heard Elon Musk, we've heard a, a lot of the giants in this space say that they, uh, they're they a little scared of AI and the future that, that we're headed towards. What about, I mean, does anything about AI stress you out? Uh, well, certainly, look, I think AI is, a, is, a, is an incredibly powerful technology, certainly one of the more powerful technologies in, you know, in our lifetimes. And like all powerful tools, it can be used for good or it can be used as a weapon. And so I think the important thing is, let's make sure that we're putting in the safeguards, uh, the safe mechanisms in place so that it is used for good. And that's what we do with the new Bing. We've put a lot of things in there in terms of responsibility to you know, protect against hate speech, to protect against violence, to protect against, protect against self-harm, so that you can get the real benefits that you want out of there, which is that ability to you know, discover the world, bring the joy of creation back. And that's what we're really trying to drive for folks. And last question, when it comes to speed, I know that you said that AGI is still a little ways away, but you also said like a couple of years. Is that, is that the timeline that you're looking at here? No, I think it's, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, it's hard. it depends on who you speak with. Uh, there's some people who think we'll never be able to get there. Uh, so, I, you know, I think it's hard to know. My, my more, my, you know, the point I'm making is we're a long ways away from getting to that. But even without AGI, you can do some incredible things today with the new thing and with the new AI capabilities. And in terms of like you were talking about, you can discover the world. Some of the incredible use cases I've seen is people do almost sort of time travel and they say, hey, what would the world look like 100 years ago? What would the LA, you know, the Seattle skyline look like when Lewis and Clark get there? There are, there are different things you can use the AI for that's really fun and entertaining and, and ways to improve that, the way you live your life today. Yeah. I got to say, your search engine changed almost overnight. Yosef Mehdi, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. And if you work for the federal government and you use TikTok, the bosses are saying this is the last week you can have TikTok on your phone, tablet, or any other government device. And that's because of an executive order by President Biden. There's also this larger push on Capitol Hill to extend that kind of order to the entire country. And they're calling it the Restrict Act. And it could ban not just TikTok, but any foreign-made software or tech that's deemed a national security threat. Joining us now is technology correspondent Jake Ward. Uh, Jake, well, actually, Jake, before we we get into that. I do want to get your impression on what you just heard about AI advances. Um, I'm not sure if you were listening, but what stood out to you? I did listen to that, Gotti. It's very interesting. Um, you know, I think Yusuf Mehdi is uh, representing a perspective that you're going to hear a lot, which is company representatives describing tremendous potential, the need for safeguards, but no clear roadmap as to how we're supposed to regulate or put guardrails around this other than to trust those companies to regulate it themselves. You know, I will say, right, the, the letter that you described that Elon Musk, you, you know, uh, uh, Yuval Harari and Stuart Russell and Steve Wozniak and, you know, more than 1,200 mm -hmm. CEOs and other AI luminaries signed, you know, they, they are really pointing to what they say as sort of these, you know, big long-term dangers. But right now, I think Yusuf Mehdi and other executives who are dealing with the day-to-day -day of how to make money off this stuff are finding, for instance, I mean, when Satya Nadella announced the integration of ChatGPT into Microsoft's Bing product, he said that his ambition was to try to take 1% of the market share of Google's search engine away from them. Well, he's done that. According to a Reuters report that came out last week, that is exactly how much they have carved away from uh, Google. So, you know, money is being made, big huge industry changing amounts of money are being made this way. And so I don't think uh, we're going to see clear regulatory roadmaps coming out of the industry while they're so busy trying to make a huge product out of it.
Jake, I love talking to you about this. So and you're kind of my therapist when it comes to a lot of things tech. One of the things that stresses me out the most is I've been playing with uh, chat GPT and AI for a few days now. And the thing that stresses me out the most is how normal it now feels. The novelty has kind of worn off. And it's almost like, you know, the first time you get in a self-driving car, you're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And then five minutes later, you're like, Actually, it's kind of boring now. I'm just going to get on my phone. And then you just assume that the technology's there. Uh, are you worried about how fast everybody's adopting this? Well, and not only, right, are you and I getting used to it in our brains, right, the market is getting used to it. And that's going to be a huge problem when it comes to, I don't know about problem, but it's certainly going to have a huge change to how society expects one can, for instance, make a living, right? We just saw a big report come out last week from Goldman Sachs that said basically the majority of knowledge work, and we're talking here about lawyers, journalists, you know, any sort of analysis work that involves the parsing of information over time, that all of that is going to be affected by this. And that means not just that it's going to be more and more normal psychologically for you and I to get into it, but it's going to be more and more normal for companies to expect that they should not pay people to do that work if AI can do it, right? That stuff is about to happen. It's happening big time and it's happening in front of us. So I think you're absolutely right that that, that instinct of normalcy that you're, you're, you're feeling about it is also how it's going to move through capitalism. That is sort of what we're going to see, I think, right now, not just in our lifetime, but in the next couple of years. It blows my mind. I know we were supposed to, to talk about TikTok. We took a little bit of a, a tangent there. Uh, but going back to TikTok and that Restrict Act, uh, now, what's, what's going on? Is this a TikTok ban or is it something bigger than that now? So it's interesting. It's being referred to popularly as this TikTok ban, but when you really read the act itself, it does not mention TikTok. What it does mention is a long list of basically every conceivable kind of technology you can imagine, you know, software, platforms, hardware, all of it, and says that any of it that the Secretary of Commerce determines to be a threat to national security and that comes from a foreign power or regime can be basically banned. And Americans who try to circumvent that ban could be punishable by up to 20 years in prison. That's why people I've been speaking to, you know, TikTok creators and others, uh, you know, who use the platform, and a you know, little reminder for everybody, 150 million Americans use that platform. They're outraged about it. They consider this to be really going against the First Amendment principles that we, you know, depend on in this country, and they think it's just a blanket overreach in terms of government intervention here. But of course, this is the thing, right? TikTok is very, very popular but it's Chinese owned. This is a moment that we've really never had to deal with before, Gotti. NBC's Jake Ward, you are our technological oracle. Thank you so very much for joining us. And when we come back on this Vietnam War De uh, Veterans Day, we're gonna tell you the story of a lost dog tag and how it was returned nearly 60 years later. It's an incredible story, so stay tuned. And today marks an important day in American history. 50 years ago, the last American soldier left Vietnam, making today National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And NBC's Harry Smith has a story of one veteran's dog tag and its long journey home. There were few parades, little fanfare, just welcome home from family and friends for those who served in Vietnam. I was a rifle platoon commander and then a company commander in the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment in the Anwar Basin. Last fall, former Senator Jim Webb led a group of Notre Dame students to that battlefield, that province where... More than 7,000 Marines had, had lost their lives, and they needed to understand how and what we were trying to do. While there, a local man appeared with a dog tag. Professor Mike Desch bought it for $20. Name and rank, Larry Hughes, Corporal. Webb wondered... Whether we were able to find him or, or his family uh, so that we could pay our respects to them. They did. I was like, oh, this has got to be some kind of scam or something. You know, I would say it doesn't sound real. Carl Hughes was wary. His Aunt Patricia broke down in tears. I just couldn't believe it. I said, are you serious? Corporal Larry Hughes was Carl's dad. Patricia Hughes, his sister. It took me way back in time as a teenage girl and my brother's gone. We don't know if he's gonna come home. Corporal Hughes did come home to Northern Florida, but passed away a couple years ago. Carl said his dad never spoke to him about Vietnam, yet. 
I joined the Marines as well, just like him, wanted to follow in his footsteps. As did Patricia's son. He served, he served in Iraq. I was in with a Marine Corps parents because we said we will never let our sons be treated like they treated the Vietnam vets. Right. Patricia told us her brother would change out of his uniform when he came home to avoid the stares and hateful words of some civilians. Jim Webb had the dog tag framed along with Corporal Hughes' military ribbons, and a ceremony was held to honor his service. But the recognition for the Vietnam vets, you couldn't have asked it for anything any better. Fulfilling the Marine motto, Semper Fidelis, Semper Fi, always faithful. Harry Smith, NBC News, Land Lakes, Florida. And before you go, here are your 60 seconds of joy. One iconic Jedi Knight is finding a very special way to help out Ukrainians. Mark Hamill, who plays a Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, is lending his voice to a Ukrainian air raid app that warns when Russian missiles or bombs might be incoming. Now, the actor says he has admired how Ukraine has shown such resilience under their terrible circumstances. Take a look. Attention, air raid alert. Proceed to the nearest shelter. Attention. The air alert is over. May the force be with you. And a large gray whale has been spotted without its fluke, meaning its tail. It's been seen swimming right off of Newport Beach here in California. This whale appears to be making the epic 12,000-mile migration from Alaska to Mexico using just its pectoral flippers. But don't worry, experts say it appears to be healthy, doesn't seem to be slowing down. That is no fluke. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We're going to see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.